Uh, back, in, back in November, Rob reached out and asked if I'd be willing uh, to present uh, and suggested uh, Robinson, uh, and I jumped at that because when I first got to Manassas, I, I, I can't tell you what it was. Um, I was drawn to the Robinson Farmstead and the story of James Robinson. I think it might be because the, the Battle of First Bull Run on Matthews Hill and Henry Hill are so well documented. Uh, while the struggle between those two at the Stone House up the Warrington Turnpike and at the Robinson Farmhouse um, aren't. Uh, and so I was kind of drawn to learn more about that. Um, so uh, I said yes <laughs> in November, uh, and then um, shortly after that was asked to be the acting superintendent and then rolled into the holidays with three young boys and various illnesses. Um, but uh, I, I, was, I was happy to do it. I loved to do um, research and, and writing uh, and had always wanted to learn more about James Robinson. And there's no better way to do that than to do the research and to write it. All right. So um, hopefully James Robinson is, is a name that you've heard before. Right? One of Prince William County's um, most famous uh, and I believe most inspirational citizens. He's born in 1799. Uh, as a free African-American. By 1850, he owned a farm that stretched over the northern and eastern half of Henry Hill uh, and directly abutted his neighbor Judith Henry's smaller Spring Hill farm. His farmstead was the scene of deadly combat during the Battle of First Manassas and was occupied and almost completely destroyed by federal troops during the three-day Battle of Second Manassas. The life and success of James Robinson is central to a better understanding of both battles of Manassas, the Civil War, and the American character. While multiple studies, uh, mostly done by the National Park Service, have researched and referenced James Robinson in relation to larger historical themes, none of them have created a clear narrative of his life and experience. And that's one of the things that immediately jumped out to me. I could go to this archaeological study, this cultural landscape uh, report, this oral history, uh, but I wanted to look at his story and his family's story in totality. Um, so this paper uh, hopefully is the first in uh, a succession of, of papers or research that, that people will come behind and do. Oh, wrong one. Just a brief timeline, again, uh, born free in 1799. He was bound out as a young man uh, somewhere around the neighborhood of the War of 1812. We don't really know. Uh, he, was late, he later said uh, that he was bound out to be taught a trade uh, and yet instead was used simply as a farm uh, laborer, something um, that he would make good use of later on uh, when he created his own farm. Um, in the late 1820s to the early 1830s, he was a waiter. Uh, at a Brentsville tavern owned by Thomas R. Hampton. We don't know what he did after that uh, to 1840. It's in 1840, at the age of 41, uh, that he bought the 170 acres on Henry Hill and started this large uh, farm. So 41, he spent uh, 20 years of his life working uh, and saving money. It took him two years to gain the legal title to the land. Uh, as a free black man. And it wasn't until 1849 that he bought or, or uh, built the house that's on the cover of the journal uh, and was finally reunited with his family after spending a quarter of a century um, apart from them. Yes? What is bound out? Bound out. It's, um, it's like an apprenticeship, right? So you're, you're bound out. It's, it's supposedly a legal agreement that would spell out uh, what you're going to do how long you're going to do it, what clothes, tools are provided to you, uh, and uh, if you're going to be paid anything. Um, and, and there's no documentation for uh, Robinson's period of being bound out. He dies in 1875 at the age of 76, right, after spending another quarter of a century, this time with uh, the majority of his family on his homestead. When he was uh, a waiter at Thomas uh, Hampton's um, tavern, uh, we do have some of those contracts. 
Uh, they do exist. It outlined that he was to have several days uh, throughout the year to visit his wife. Um, and that was in 1828. So we know uh, that um, he had a wife uh, and children by 1828. Um, Hampton's Tavern was in Brentsville. And Robinson, no doubt, was one of a, uh, the studies in the Park Service has put forward. Robinson, no doubt, learned much about county affairs. If you can imagine being a waiter um, in uh, a tavern right next to the, to the courthouse. He likewise learned who held power and who was in trouble. He saw who sold slaves, who traded them, who conducted business, and he watched how deals were transacted. Uh, and internalized uh, these lessons unfolding in front of him. This is a, a census from 1850. Uh, let's see, we've got the Matthews, we've got the, the Henrys, and then down here uh, we have the Robinson family. So you've got James Robinson, Susan, and um, several children, grandchildren, uh, and perhaps uh, an aged aunt. He had at least six children. His first child, Jemima, was born sometime in the 1820s, followed by Alfred, uh, or followed by James Jr., Alfred, Tasco, Henrietta, and finally Bladen in 1844. Because his wife Susan remained enslaved by local farmer John Lee, each of his children inherited the status of their mother, and so under Virginia law were born into slavery. So again, for over 20 years, James Robinson was forced to reside separately from his enslaved family. Robinson was able to pay Lee to hire out his own son, Tasco, to work on the family farm starting in 1846. Um, and Robinson clearly managed to establish a relationship with John Lee over 20 years because when Lee died in 1848, Lee's will stated that he did, quote, give and bequeath, uh, unquote, to James Robinson, uh, Susan and Henrietta, as well, as well as freeing his daughter Jemima and her children um, to, quote, live with James Robinson. Tasco uh, and Bladen may have been purchased from slavery by their father or otherwise freed by Lee and his estate. Um, sons James and Alfred were not included in any arrangement, and we'll get to that uh, in just a moment. All right. So, the... Uh, the society uh, and the population uh, that, that James Robinson lived in uh, and, and conducted business and farmed in uh, in Prince William County uh, changed between 1800 and 1860. Uh, in 1800, just 1% of um, African Americans um, in Prince William County were free. 40% uh, of the population was enslaved. Uh, and the remaining 59% of the population was white. That's gonna change by 1860, um, uh, over a half a century later. 3% of the county's population uh, consists of freed blacks, like James Robinson. The enslaved population uh, has gone down to 28%, um, and 69% of the population is white. But keep in mind, while these percentages shift, the whole the, the totality of the population doesn't stay the same. Uh, the overall population declines. Uh, so the white population uh, in Prince William County goes down by some 36%. Uh, this uh, was because many farmers abandoned the area and headed west or further south during a tumultuous cycle of depressions and panics. Uh, and then the enslaved population went from a high of 5,416 individuals in 1800 to 2,356 individuals in 1860. And the main reason for this de decline in the enslaved population uh, was the sale and transport of individuals across uh, the state and elsewhere in the South, while the uh, free population went from 1% to 3%. Included uh, in the enslaved that were sold during this time uh, period uh, were two of James Robinson's sons, his two oldest sons. First, James Robinson, 
um, seen here on a ship manifest bound from uh, Richmond to New Orleans in May of 1851. Uh, and then in 1852, his son Alfred Robinson, uh, likewise from Richmond down to uh, New Orleans. Family tradition and history say that Alfred and James were stonemasons uh, and were quite skilled. Uh, and that may be uh, one of the reasons why in John Lee's will, uh, he did not free them. Um, the, the family might have uh, prevailed upon Lee to, to, to do that. Um, of his two sons that are sold, James and Alfred, uh, he will never see them again. After the war and after James Robinson's death, one of his sons will come back uh, from Louisiana. And help me out here, Liz, I can't remember, I think it's Alfred. It's Alfred, yeah. So his namesake, uh, his oldest son, uh, does not return to the family farmstead uh, and neither are reunited with their father. All right. So by 1850, here's Henry Hill. There's roughly the delineation between Judith Henry's farm uh, and James Robinson's farm. Now, the outline here uh, is kind of arbitrary. This is uh, within the confines of the park. This is, this is Nova, so it was not included in the study. Um, so I've been asking how far exactly did Judith Henry's farm extend? And we know that Robinson's farm did not quite extend all this way until after the war. But Judith uh, Henry had about a 100 acre farm, 75 acres of which were under cultivation. Robinson uh, had 130, uh, 100 of which were under cultivation. <coughs> all right, let me just check my notes real quick, make sure. Oh. The other thing I wanted to say about the population here is while the overall population is declining, there is an influx of new people into the county as well. You, you have a lot of farmers in the county who are pulling up stakes and moving out to the Shenandoah Valley or farther down south. And then you have families that are moving from um, New Jersey, Delaware, Pennsylvania and settling in um, Maryland. So for example, the diversification of agriculture and business um, was due to an influx of people from Maryland, New Jersey, New York, and other northern states. Uh, in neighboring Fairfax County, for example, by 1847, some 200 northern families had settled in Fairfax County alone. One in three white men living in Fairfax had migrated there from the north or from outside the United States. So in addition to farmers, some were professionals, lawyers, physicians, clergy, clergymen, etc. So the world in which James Robinson moved, uh, especially from his 30s to his 50s, was one of shifting demographics and economic diversification, uh, and one in which he shrewdly, shrewdly moved. All right. So how did he do that? Uh, that involved maintaining good, uh, establishing and maintaining good relationships uh, with his white neighbors. Um, and he did so for over 20 years. Robinson engaged in various business dealings with many prominent whites in the area, including the Carters, the Dogans, the Matthews brothers, and Wilmer McLean. Many in the area referred to James Robinson as Gentleman Jim, uh, which was a way of acknowledging his success and social prowess, but also framing that recognition within a rigidly defined racial hierarchy. Right? Think about that for a second. No one is going to refer to the white Edward Carter or the white Wilmer McLean as Gentleman Ed or Gentleman Will. They're going to refer to them as Mr. Carter, Mr. McLean. They're not calling James Robinson Mr. Robinson. They're calling him Gentleman Jim. James Robinson was certainly shrewd enough to understand, though, that local whites could and would only go so far in accepting his success. And he apparently embraced that moniker, or the nickname, uh, in order to carefully navigate his relationships with others. So very successful uh, by uh, 1861, uh, when the Civil War begins, reunited with his family um, and accumulating accumulating some uh, wealth. Uh, the 1850 census, it valued his uh, farm at over $1,000. Um, 
Um, that's all going to change uh, with the advent of the Civil War, right? So if you've been to Manassas National Battlefield, uh, the Battle of First Manassas, July 21st, 1861, begins way up here on Henry Hill, or I'm sorry, Matthews Hill, and concludes over here around the Henry House, where the Visitor Center is today on Henry Hill. And if you read any of the, the numerous books out there, uh, they'll go into the campaign, the overall um, early morning flanking attack, the, the battle at, at Matthews Hill, uh, and then all of the, the action on, on Henry House. But everything that happens here is just kind of mentioned <clears throat> very briefly. Um, and part of that is, as the first battle of the war, which soon gets eclipsed by many other events, um, it's not well documented. Um, or at least we haven't found um, a lot of reports um, that provide a, a clear narrative of what happens here. It's very, very confusing uh, with the fighting coming down to Stonehouse, up the Warrington Turnpike, um, etc. But what we do know, um, and here's a, a great view, you've got Stonehouse intersection down there, you've got Matthews Hill over here, and then this is the Robinson Farm Lane. I'm basically standing on the spot where Robinson House uh, was. Uh, right? So the battle began here and, and then moved into the Stonehouse intersection and then came up the road uh, and then burst onto uh, the Robinson Farmstead uh, around 11.30 noon on July 21st, 1861. Now, where were the Robinsons? Right? Um, they'd gotten out of Dodge, um, so they say. Oral history says, uh, from his great-grandson, says that they took refuge in the cellar of the Van Pelt House. Um, so this is looking north, right? The Van Pelt House would have been over here. Um, so oral tradition from the family says they, they hid in the cellar of the Van Pelt House and that Robinson himself hid under the Turnpike Bridge over Young's Branch. Uh, and this is... Um, uh, repeated later in a post-war newspaper article where Robinson's r wife um, says that they hid in the cellar of a house and that Robinson hid under a bridge. But she doesn't say exactly where. So it's unlikely that this occurred for two reasons. First, if you're James Robinson and you're his family, uh, you would have either safely evacuated days prior to the battle, right, or it would have been done at the last minute. So if you had evacuated prior to the battle, right, like the day before when Confederate troops came into the area, there had been fighting at Blackburn's Ford on July 18th. Something's going on. There's artillery, there's musketry. It's time to get the kids, get the wife, and get out, right? So if you had done it in advance, they would have certainly availed themselves of the opportunity to get out of harm's way, most likely south and west. If they waited until the morning of the battle, when Union artillery at Stone Bridge opened up, they would not have gone towards the Van Pelt House, which was being shelled by Union artillery, right? Um, so fortunately for the Robinsons, they got out, and it was good that they did, because Confederate, a Confederate brigade under um, Wade Hampton is going to line up in the Robinson farm lane uh, and be pouring down fire in this direction on federal troops that are trying to come up from the stone house. And while they're doing that, with their right flank facing the Warrenton Turnpike, out of these trees, which weren't there during the battle, or, or basically over the lip of the northern uh, part of, of Henry Hill, um, come two federal regiments. Catch them by surprise. They drive across the Warrenton Turnpike, down the, the farm lane, and there's fighting um, along um, the farmstead. In the words of one historian, John Hennessy, um, quote, the landscape around the Robinson House exploded in battle as a hastily assembled line of Virginians, Carolinians, Georgians, and Alabamians, probably 1,100 men in all, leveled their muskets and loosed a volley that rocked Key's ranks. So there's a lot of back and forth here uh, between uh, Wade Hampton's South Carolinians, probably the 5th Virginia, some remnants of uh, Bartow and B's brigades from Matthews Hill, um, all fighting off that Union attack. Um, the Federals pull back. Uh, there's some quiet over the battlefield, and that's when things are going to shift over to uh, uh, the Henry farm with Ricketts rolling his guns into position. A lot more 
that can be done, trying to um, parse out the, the tactical narrative. What happened, who was where around the Robinson farm. So what happened after the battle? Robinson and his family returned to a battlefield littered with uh, the detritus of battle, uh, including corpses, uh, and they find the Confederate army victorious. Robinson stated in his 1872 deposition uh, for damages for Second Manassas that the rebels, quote, behaved well to me somehow or other. They never took anything from me but one of my horses. Uh, he also followed that up by acknowledging that, you know, whenever the Confederates asked for something, quote, we were compelled to give it to them or they would have taken it. Um, what's interesting in his 1872 deposition, you, you can download it off of Fold3 and Ancestry.com uh, if you want to. And the park has a typed up copy of it too. Um, the deposition goes on and on and on and on and on about federal um, depredation, second Manassas. But before they get to that, the uh, council interviewing Robinson, they're trying to find out, like, did you aid and abet any of the Confederacy, you know, during your, your time there outside of Second Manassas? So he's got to be very strong and say, no, I didn't, uh, or I was forced to. I think the reality um, was probably that Robinson fell back uh, uh, again on everything that he had learned throughout his life uh, as a free black man in a county in a slave state, navigating those relationships. Um, so when troopers uh, or, or soldiers were coming to his home, he may very well have met them with food and supplies and offered it freely. Uh, who knows? Um, he was very careful uh, to answer those questions very succinctly and move on to what the Federals had done. This is a post-war view of the Confederate Army being rallied by uh, General P.G.T. Beauregard and General Joseph Johnston. Uh, and in the background, you can see the Robinson uh, home and farmstead. When this was done, the Robinson farm was much bigger. It had been, uh, the, or the house, it had been uh, improved upon in 1871. So this is more a representation of the post-war home uh, than, than anything else. But again, it does give you an idea that the Robinson Farmstead is central uh, to understanding the first battle of Manassas. And in fact, PGT Beauregard and Wade Hampton will both make note of the fact that uh, Robinson was free. Um, so whether they met him or not after the battle, we don't know. Um, but somehow or other, they found out in writing their report about this battle that swirled around this farmstead that it, it wasn't a white man. It, it was re remarkable enough to them that they wrote it in their official correspondence to the Confederate government that, you know, the fighting around the Robinson farmstead, you know, comma, who was free? <clears throat> so after the battle, um, there were at least 13 dead uh, Confederates that were buried uh, in, his, in and around his uh, home. This is a 1862 view of some burials uh, from First Manassas, um, just outside what is today the Visitor Center. Um, so imagine, you know, having your home shot up uh, and then coming uh, home and finding out that um, Confederate soldiers are being actively buried uh, in your front and, and side yard. <laughs> Was Robinson compelled to assist? Did he volunteer to assist? Was he compensated? We don't know. Um, once the battle is over, Confederate troops are going to occupy that area from July to March of 1862, right? So it's, it's not over for Robinson. There are Confederate troops marching down the Warrenton Turnpike. There are Confederate cavalry moving through the area. An entire brigade of Confederates go in a winter quarters at the Port Portisi farm just to the south of his farmstead. Um, how he managed to keep his family and home and livestock and crops safe through all of that just astounds me. Um, I think that is probably due to the rise of the nascent Confederate logistics system. The fact that because the Confederates are in winter quarters and they're not actively marching and fighting, it's a lot easier for the Confederate Army and the states to supply uh, and, and feed their troops. Um, but I have to believe um, that he lost some livestock or some crops uh, or offered them up 
or was paid for them. Um, however he did it, he managed to get through till March of 62 when federal troops uh, came in. Uh, and uh, when he, in his post-war deposition, he said, when they came in force in March of 1862, Robinson talked with the federal troops and, quote, said, uh, he said, he, quote, hoped they would gain the day. Um, because as he was explaining to this uh, white man taking his deposition in 1872, who asked if he had any Southern sympathies at the time, he was like, yeah, no, we knew that, you know, if the Confederacy triumphed, it would be, mean the breaking up of our freedom. And he, he said, quote, I scorned the view of it. I, I think that gives you a, a sense of, of, of Robinson's dry uh, and understated sense of humor. This is a March of 1862 photograph of the Robinson uh, home. It's about 16 to 18 feet square. This is the south side, the Warrington Turnpike's over here. Robinson deliberately made his front porch and his front door face opposite of the Warrington Turnpike. And you do see that a lot um, with other uh, free uh, black homes um, throughout the, uh, Virginia. Right? It, it helps add to that sense of privacy, right? Uh, that, you know, as you're going up Warrington Turnpike, the house is set back and there's no door. It, it's not really very greeting. We don't know who these two um, women are, um, but it's quite possible that that's his wife, Susan, um, and one of his daughters or granddaughters. This is a view from the Robinson farm. Uh, you can see uh, the snake rail fence. Here is the uh, farm lane that joins the main road. This, this is the road that turns and goes to the Henry house, or what was the Henry house. There's the remains of the, the Henry home, the chimney. Um, so Jackson's men would have come out on, the, on this road and lined up about here. So the main fighting in the afternoon is here. So. If, Thanks to George Bernard for getting out there in March of 1862 and taking some photographs. All right, second Manassas uh, was an absolute disaster for the Robinson family farm. Stonewall Jackson's destruction of the Federal Depot at Manassas was mir mirrored by the Federal destruction of the Robinson family farm at the hand of Federal troops. So on the night of August 28th, Thursday, elements of Franz Siegel's uh, First Corps uh, arrive on Henry Hill um, towards late afternoon, dusk, uh, uh, really after the fighting at Brawner Farm um, and in camp. Uh, one of the first things they do is barge into the Robinson uh, house, right, and ransack it. And they take everything, including beds and all the cups, knives, forks, and dishes. James Robinson and his son Tasco are home. The rest of the family is not. There had been enough going on, um, I believe, with Jackson getting behind the Federal Army, ransacking Manassas, um, that uh, Robinson, being a smart guy, realizes something's up. Uh, and certainly when the fighting erupts at Bronner's farm, if he hadn't gotten his family out by then, uh, he certainly does by the afternoon or evening of the 28th. <clears throat> so it's just him and his son Tasco at the farm when thousands of federal troops show up, make camp in his fields, um, and start taking anything and everything they want. The house is systematically looted um, until only one bed remained. Robinson asked an officer standing in the doorway of his home, quote, if he was going to take everything from me that night, unquote. The officer answered rather dryly, um, that no, uh, he was holding that bed for the use of General Siegel. Uh, and the house was quickly turned into First Corps headquarters. Um, and most likely that evening, James and his son Tasco, under guard, uh, were forced to sleep out of doors uh, of their own home and watched it be looted. Uh, there were, uh, Robinson, years later, 1872, vividly remembered that evening the whoops of delight uh, from federal troops as they started going into all the various outbuildings and they found two massive barrels of salted Potomac herring. 
uh, and they're struggling to get it open until one of the soldiers took a, a, a musket and with the butt of his musket burst all of the hoops and then the fish just spilled out uh, and there was a melee. Um, he, Robinson recalled in 1872 that the soldiers, quote, had to make their grabs uh, to see who should get the most. So just, these are hungry guys. These, these, are, these are hungry troops. Um, you know, they, they, they justify to Robinson the reason they're taking all of his silverware uh, and, and tableware is they've got nothing, right? They've, they've lost everything at Manassas Junction. So that, the next morning, Robinson uh, is asked by several officers, perhaps by General Siegel himself, to guide them to uh, a crossroads because they're going to cut off Jackson. The, the Union Army believed that uh, they had General Jackson uh, uh, in a trap. Uh, it was the other way around, if you know anything about Second Manassas. Um, but Robinson uh, is on horseback, and he goes with these uh, federal officers. I'm not sure uh, if he was taking them to the crossroads of Groveton or if he was going to take them up to the crossroads around uh, Sudley Mill. Doesn't say. Just says, the crossroads define Jackson. When Confederate pickets were spotted, Robinson reined in his horse and curtly informed the assembled officers that he would not go any further for, quote, Jackson's men are in the woods and I am not going to get shot. <laughs> uh, turned around and at that point they, cl they clearly let him go. Um, when he got back to his farm in the early light of day, the scene of destruction must have just ripped his heart out. Uh, he said there were a multitude of generals and troops. He recalled they were like ants. Locusts might have been a more apt description. For 20 tons of hay in stacks around the house and in hay meadows were now gone. So this is Franz Siegel, uh, and this is his first brigade, uh, first division commander, Julius Stahl, uh, who Robinson will, in fact, speak to uh, later on that day. All right. 20 tons of hay and stacks around the house and hay meadow were gone. 40 bushels of oats, likewise, had disappeared. 20 bushels of corn, gone. 300 pounds of bacon in the meat house had been seized and were actively being consumed on cook fires, dotting his fields. Seven of his eight hogs were in the process of being slaughtered when he pulled up. Somehow, in the midst of all of that, I guess because of the, the confusion and, and, and just orgy of destruction, he was able to get in there. He got the eighth hog away, led it uh, to a pen, where miraculously the animal remained unharmed. Uh, but that victory was short-lived, because when he returned to the house, his cows were being driven off. So Robinson ran after the federal troops that were driving off his two cows, and an officer said, quote, my man... Let me tell you, I have some of the worst men out there that you ever saw. And if you go out there, they will take you for a reb and they will shoot you. And you had better think more of your life than you do of your beeves or cows. So Robinson had to watch them taken off into the woods uh, and then uh, listen to their cries as they were butchered. He did go to 1st Division Commander uh, Julius Stahl and protested and said, Stahl paid me no attention in the world. He bitterly remembered. At that moment, his son Tasco came out and said they were making off with the horses. And at that point, Robinson said, let them do it, for I cannot get a guard. Compounding insult to injury, that evening, uh, a flood of wounded soldiers were brought to Robinson's farm. Uh, and soon, both father and son witnessed the horrors of battlefield triage as young men suffered and died all around them in their backyard, on their porch, and in their home, where their family had dwelt. So I don't think Robinson slept uh, very well on the night of the 28th and the 29th, if at all. Uh, and on the following morning, he found, them once, he found, he found himself once again navigating um, uh, those uh, contentious interactions. Artillery mules had ravaged his cornfields, and where the mules uh, had missed something, hungry soldiers had cut everything else down. Even the acre of buried potatoes had not escaped the federal troops. Um, as Robinson said, they just went in and dug them up. Uh, over two miles of fences across his sprawling farm had been torn down and turned into cooking fires. 
Uh, his early possessions had been stolen by federal troops or tossed about the yard in his house. Um, and his home was occupied by surgeons doing the grisly work of tending the wounded. On the morning of August 30th, James Robinson was faced with the stark reality that he might be ruined and his family might starve. Things got worse that afternoon and evening when Confederate General uh, James Longstreet launched a massive uh, counterattack with over 25,000 men that's going to roll up the Union left flank for over a mile until finally being stopped by a hasty defense uh, along Sudley Road at the base of Henry Hill. So in the darkness, Robinson sees artillery lining up on the heights, belching out fire to Chin Ridge. Troops are marching past his home double time while wounded are coming back uh, to the house frantically being piled into wagons. I mean, it, it must have seemed like the apocalypse. What he did not know at that moment while the wounded were being for, uh, placed into wagons is that his son Tasco was being forced into, into a wagon to go with the uh, federal wounded and to tend for them. The Union Army uh, is going to fight off the Confederate counterattack uh, and then slowly make their way down the Warrington Turnpike to Centerville. Uh, so with the Union Army gone, now Robinson has to face yet again more Confederate troops coming from what state? Virginia, Alabama, Georgia, South Carolina. They don't know him. He's got to navigate that interaction as well. Whew. Crazy times for James Robinson. Um, and even after, fortunately for him this time, the Confederate Army does not stay long. Right? Um, because very quickly they're hot on the heels trying to outflank the Union Army again, and then later on they cross the Potomac, going up into Maryland and fighting the Battle of Antietam. So for the rest of the war, 1863, 1864, uh, it's Mosby's partisan rangers galloping down the Warrington Turnpike, Federal cavalry in hot pursuit, Union troops marching down the Turnpike. Every interaction with both Confederate and Union troops could possibly turn hostile. Uh, deadly in a moment, uh, all the while trying to maintain uh, for his family. This is some of the damages uh, that uh, Robinson applied for after the war. 25 tons of hay, 60 bushels of wheat, 20 bushels of corn, two horses, seven fat hogs. Got to make sure we get in. They weren't undersized. They were big fat hogs, right? Um, Three barrels of fish, I'm sorry, I said two, uh, eventually over 800 pounds of bacon, two fat cattle, an acre in potatoes, 12 acres in corn uh, in field, groceries and provisions in the house, uh, beds and other furniture, 250. The, the garden was destroyed, uh, and the use of the house as a hospital and service of self and family as nurses, $200. Later on, he would also add to that the... Um, uh, 12,600 fence rails and 25 acres of oats. He asked for $2,608 in damages. Ah, he got half, $1,249. Um, but this was not atypical um, as in the years, I mean, this is 1872, right? And the government's still processing claims for damages done by its forces to loyal uh, Americans throughout uh, the war, um, and no one's ever given the amount uh, that they are asked for. Um, so he is not slighted because he is a, a free black man. Um, everyone, <laughs> everyone is being uh, slighted. Uh, this is what we believe to be an 1865 view of the home. Looking at the east entrance, you can kind of make out the steps to the second floor garret. All right. We'll come back to that. All right. A year uh, in 1863, one federal officer passing through Manassas wrote that, quote, this section of country is one vast graveyard. At every step might be picked up a piece of shell, a cartridge box, and here and there an occasional mound pointing out where a heap of dead lay buried. The officer predicted that for years to come, Every farm will turn up some sad memento of destructive war. In 1865, while the war is still going on, 
um, or winding down. It's June, so Lee has surrendered. Lincoln has been assassinated, uh, but there are still various pockets of Confederate um, armed resistance that are, are capitulating. Federal troops um, erect on the battlefield at Manassas a monument to the dead who are still buried there. They erected this monument to, uh, says, in memory of the patriots who fell at Bull Run. This is one of the earliest monuments on any Civil War battlefield, and it's at first Manassas. Not Antietam, not Gettysburg, not Vicksburg, Manassas. And they put two of them. After dedicating this one, they went to Groveton and erected a monument to second Manassas. The scene of two of the most humiliating defeats of the Federal Army is the site where veterans of the war themselves erect some of the first monuments. They recognized that those temporary defeats were necessary for um, ultimate victory. So they had this massive, huge celebration and dedication ceremony. Robinson's farm or home is just off the, the picture. And I've wondered, was he there? Did he listen? Did he hear uh, what they had to say? Was he allowed to go up there? Was he turned away? I've, I've searched through these photos. Um, I don't know what James Robinson looked like. Uh, he was light-skinned, really hard to see uh, with some of these. But maybe one day we'll, we'll find him uh, staring back at us over the 160 years. What was interesting when they dedicated this monument uh, is they immediately stated that um, the defeats were not in vain, right? The dead did not die in vain, and that the cause of the war was slavery, uh, and that states like Virginia paid for that. They sang a song, a song specifically created for the occasion of the monument dedication, set to the tune of Old Hundred, uh, also known as the doxology. First verse, here in their country's trial hour, trial by battle, stood the brave against a fierce and fearful power, the power that held and scourged the slave. Here on Virginia's sacred soil, where slavery bred and drove the gangs, the hard serpent lay in coil. Here freedom's sons first felt her fangs. They fought, they fell, but not in vain lost they the battle of Bull Run. The blows that broke the bondman's chain at last were on this ground begun. They fell, but not for naught they bled. For no honest blow is ever given, no rousing word is ever said in freedom's cause or the cause of heaven that goes for nothing in the score. A very complicated 19th century way of saying that in heaven they are keeping score and um, honest blows and rousing words are, are marked. Um, it's just a weird way of saying it. No thirsty ground is drenched with gore, of course, in heaven. No poet sings, no soldier dies. Slavery may wet her cutthroat's knife or rain down her assassin's ball. The martyr may lay down his life. Seward may bleed and Lincoln fall, right? This is June. Lincoln's assassinated that previous April. But freedom's arm is stronger yet, lifted in earnest for her sons, than is the traitor's bayonet, the murderer's knife, the pirate's guns. No spirit of reconciliation in June of 1865. <laughs> no doubt over the causes uh, and effect of the war. Um, I, you know, I, I think it's amazing and, and wonderful in a way that we still passionately argue and debate and research the cause and impact of the Civil War. We should always do that. Um, and I think it's just as important that we always go back and look at what they said themselves. What did they say? The men who fought the war um, in the moment. Not years later when they were trying to write their memoirs and justify it in magazines this way or that way, uh, but what they said. And so, upon the bloody spot where now this monument is raised, shall rebel bones and memories rot, but patriots' names for air be praised. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Uh, come out, if, if, uh, if you want to hear this song uh, or sing it, uh, come out on Memorial Day. We do uh, a, uh, a ceremony at the monument. We include a lot of the original speeches 
Uh, and last year we had a young lady from uh, George Mason University who came out and led us in the singing of the song. Um, and it was really, really neat. Keep in mind, again, when, when, when this was written, both federal and Confederate dead from both battles were still buried and scattered across the landscape. That'll change. After the war, um, federal uh, grave diggers, now I know this is a very famous photograph uh, from the Cold Harbor and Wilderness area, uh, digging up the dead uh, in 1865 from the battle a year previously. But this is what it's going to look like across James Robinson uh, and Judith Henry's farm, across the, the farms of the Matthews, the Thornberries. This is what the kids, uh, the Thornberry kids, are, are walking out and seeing every day in 1866 and 1867 as the federal dead are disinterred, moved to Arlington, and reinterred uh, in a mass tomb. Confederate dead are come. Uh, various families come out from all the different states. The states themselves come, reclaim a lot. Uh, those that aren't claimed are buried uh, in a mass grave at Groveton, one of the few Confederate cemeteries within um, a national park. And uh, that continues throughout the 1870s and 1880s. Um, <clears throat> James Robinson's great-grandson, Oswald Robinson, recalled in the early 1900s that we would invariably plow into corpses. My father and grandfather required that we as boys would pick up all that was left to bring them up to Groveton to rebury them in the common burial ground. Every year, you're out there farming your land, a nine and a feather bed. Um, in 1871, um, Robinson is going to begin the construction of a new two-story addition to his home. Um, the next year, he has the windfall of almost $1,300 from the federal government for the damages uh, from Second Manassas. He continues to live modestly. I mean, he buys new farm equipment, but he doesn't flaunt it. He could have, uh, have afforded a better house. Um, he could have, you know, trotted out all the new farm equipment and left it out there for all of his poor white neighbors to see. Um, but he realized, uh, in some ways, probably the Reconstruction era uh, in Prince William County was even more dangerous to navigate than the antebellum era uh, had been. Because Robinson comes out of the Civil War, despite the destruction, with what can be termed as generational wealth. He's successful, while the majority of his white neighbors are left with practically nothing. Um, many poor whites and ex-slaves may do with next to nothing. The Monroe family, for example, a white family, never regained a sense of stability after the war. The estate appraisal in February 1870 testified to their impoverishment. It included no livestock, a few farm implements, and but a small amount of household furnishings valued at $339. Robinson was worth thousands of dollars by the time of his death uh, in 1875. His farm was prospering. His family was economically secure. The wartime structure was finally dismantled in 1926, uh, and descendants and family continued to live the, uh, in the 1926 house until, the until 1936. Uh, this is, a, I believe, a 1940s um, picture of it. When the Park Service took over in 1940, 1941, uh, the house was in a very, very poor condition. There were no windows. The floor had rotted out. Um, they very quickly put up some timber uh, to stabilize the structure. Uh, and then over the ensuing decades, did make additional uh, improvements to stabilize the structure. Unfortunately, it was heavily damaged by uh, arson in 1993. Uh, the, an architectural analysis of the post-war home said, it can't, can't fix it. Um, so it was dismantled. As it was being dismantled, uh, they did an architectural analysis. And we still have the majority of that home deconstructed in storage. What do you do with a burned out, deconstructed home? Um, you store it. All right, so then what do you do? 
and that's been the challenge of the Park Service since. How do you best tell James Robinson's amazing story? Everyone's heard of Stonewall Jackson, and rightly so. Everyone's heard of the death of Judith Henry uh, in battle, and rightly so. But my God, James Robinson and his family, that just rounds out the story and makes it all the more compelling. So we did an architectural analysis of the home in 1995, uh, and in pulling out the attic, found a treasure trove of James Robinson documents dating back to the 1820s. Uh, super cool. Uh, we geeked out over that. Um, a two-year archaeological study was conducted in 1995, 1996. A comprehensive study in 2001. Um, a historic resource study of the Manassas community in 2003. A general management plan in 2008. A long-range interpretive plan in 2018. A cultural landscape inventory in 2019. And a cultural landscape report in 2020. Uh, and this is, this is what the cultural landscape report looks like. It's, it's huge and has fun pull out maps and, and, all, and recommendations and, uh, and everything like that. We're the government. We like to do studies. Um, we know everything there is to know about the physical landscape, the archaeological landscape, uh, and we know an awful lot about um, the Robinsons themselves. And we're just now starting to pull that together into a narrative form. Um, so the, the question that I raised when I got uh, to Manassas in April of 21 was, that's great. What are we doing with it? What are we doing with it? Uh, when it was torn down, the, uh, the, the chimney was there until finally the chimney had to be taken down. These are some of the original documents. And this is the, the site today. Right? You don't know it's there unless you walk up on it. So if you're at Henry House or the Visitor Center, you look out, and I think most visitors believe this was all, it's Henry Hill. There's Judith Henry's post-war home. This must all be the Henry farm. So the Robinsons, they exist. They're here. They're in the studies. But they're not in the landscape. Uh, and unfortunately, I think a lot of visitors miss out on that compelling story. Uh, and also, um, the tactical stuff that happened there uh, during the battle. Here we are looking back at the post-war Judith Hen or Henry home and the visitor center. Um, we need to rebuild it. Uh, something needs to go there. Uh, we have uh, asked for funding and have started the multi-year process, because this is the government, um, to construct the wartime shell of the home so that you will see it on the landscape. We are also working uh, with Purdue University on an orchard management plan to replant both the Henry and Robinson Farm orchards. Uh, and we're also working on some fences um, so that both sites look more like they did um, agriculturally and domestically during um, the battle. James Robinson lived a tremendous life that intersected directly with the most transformative moment in American history. The telling of his story and how it relates to the battles of First and Second Manassas has been deferred for too long. It is a story that deserves to be told in equal measure with the history of Judith Henry and the soldiers that fought across the farm. James Robinson remained indefatigable in the face of war the threat of economic ruin, the enslavement of his entire family, and institutional racism. His story, in my mind, is as inspirational as the resolve of the United States in the wake of the defeats at Manassas. Thank you. Jim, I think you're going to be sticking around for a little while. Yeah, okay, I will so happily. We'll put them out there if anybody has any questions about them. Yes, ma'am. Did Oswald Robinson live somewhere near the property in the 1900s still? Yes. I couldn't look at a map and tell you exactly where, but we do have rangers who could, and we do have those documents. I will point out my, my colleague, Liz uh, Hokinson, in the front row, who's also done a lot of uh, Robinson research, and it was Oswald. I don't know. 
I think that was a, the so-called cannonball house. He put a cannonball on his 1920s home uh, as a joke. Um, I, don't, I don't know. I'm sorry, there was one other question over here. Yes. Yes, and that's one of the reasons why we're able, uh, and we have been able to convince at the regional level uh, that a recreation of the home uh, is feasible because they did such a comprehensive archaeological analysis. So did you find no, 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 no human remains were found. Um, lots of bullets with the fight on the farm lane. Uh, and then a lot of agricultural stuff. So it would appear, I, and I would imagine that very shortly after the war, you know, as, as uh, you know, uh, South Carolinians came up, he would have been like, hey, there's 13 of them, here, 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 and here. Um, yeah, uh, and then he probably, if he ran into any, uh, as uh, Oswald said, they were then reinterred. Yep. But, but you found just six years ago it was, it was long in that. 2014, we found the remains of two federal soldiers from New York uh, and about 13 amputated limbs. That's right. All national parks are hallowed ground uh, by virtue of the fact that even though, you know, they came in and they did their best, they didn't get everybody and they didn't get all of everybody that they got. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we don't allow metal detecting and digging. <laughs>